Joshua chapter 7, verse 1, but the children of Israel committed a trespass in the cursed thing. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zebedi, and the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel, and Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside beth Aven, on the east side of Bethel, and spake unto them, saying, Go up and view the country. And the men went up and viewed Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said unto him, Let not all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and smite Ai, and make not all the people to labor thither, for they are but few. So there went up thither of the people about three thousand men, and they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai smote them about sixty, thirty and six men, for they chased them from before the gate even to Shibrium, and smote them in going down, wherefore the hearts of the people melted and became as water. And Joshua rent his clothes and fell in the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord until the even tide. And he and the elders of Israel had put dust upon their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, wherefore hast thou at all brought this people over Jordan to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites and to destroy us? Would to God that we had been content and dwell on the other side of Jordan? O Lord, what shall I say when Israel turneth their backs before their enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land shall hear of it, and shall ever in on us, and cut off our name from the earth. And what wilt thou do unto thy great name? And the Lord said unto Joshua, Get thee up, wherefore liest thou thus upon thy face? Israel has sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they have taken of the accursed thing, and have also stolen and dissembled also. And they have put it even among their own stuff. Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their back before their enemies, because they were accursed. Neither will I be with you any more, except ye destroy the accursed from among you. Up, sanctify the people, and say, Sanctify yourselves against tomorrow, for thus saith the Lord God of Israel, There is an accursed thing in the midst of thee, O Israel. Thou canst not stand before thine enemies until ye take away the accursed thing from among you. In the morning, therefore, ye shall be brought according to your tribes, and it shall be that the tribe which the Lord taketh shall come according to the family thereof, and the family which the Lord shall take shall come by household, and the household which the Lord shall take shall come by man. And it shall be that he that taketh the accursed thing shall be burnt with fire, and he and all that he hath, because he hath transgressed the covenant of the Lord, and because he hath wrought folly in Israel. So Joshua rose up early in the morning and brought Israel by their tribes, and their tribes of Judah was taken. And he brought the family of Judah, and he took the family of the Zerites. And he brought the family of the Zerites, man by man, and Zab Zabadai was taken. And he brought his household, man by man, and Achan, the son of Camari, the son of Zabadai, the Zerah, of the tribe of Judah was taken. And Joshua said unto Achan, My son, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel, and make confession unto him, and tell me how now what thou hast done. Hide it not from me. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. And when I saw the spoils of godly Babylonian garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels of weight, then I coveted them and took them. And behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. So Joshua sent messengers and they ran into the tent and behold, it was hid in his tent and the silver under it. And they took them out in the midst of the tent and brought them to Joshua and to all the children of Israel and laid them out before the Lord. And Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan the son of Zerah and the silver and the garment and the wedge of gold and his sons and his daughters and his oxen and his ass and his sheep and his tent and all that he had. And he brought them into the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, Why hast thou troubled us? The Lord shall trouble thee this day. And all Israel stoned him with stones and burned them with fire after they had stolen them with stones. 
And they raised over him a great heap of stones unto this day. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. Wherefore, the name of that place is called, was called the Valley of Achor unto this day. God, I just pray right now that you'll speak in a mighty way. Let your anointing, God, be upon your servant. Speak to every heart here today. And we give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. I want to speak to you today. Troubled, aching heart. Troubled, aching heart. Here, folks, Israel has just been involved in the greatest military conquest in their history. <coughs> They have just witnessed the tremendous defeat of the city of Jericho. And they were still basking in the glow of that great event. But verse 1 tells us that God was upset with his people. They thought that they were standing on the edge of great string of victories that would see them conquering the entire land of promise. And yet, what they did not know at this point was that there was a problem. There was sin in the camp. There was one in the midst who was causing a problem for the entire family. <coughs> Things are still similar today. <coughs> we are members of one body. Amen? Amen. In, in 1 Corinthians 12, 26 to 27, and whether one's members suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. You see, folks, when one member of the body has problems, the entire body has problems. And what you do affects the entire church. Sin causes problems. It causes problems for them, the sinner, and for everyone else around them. Remember the first trip to Jordan. When we allow folks, our, allow sin into our lives, and when we try to hide our sins and we try to cover it up, we bring pain and trouble into our lives but the root of the separation from God is sin amen the root of all separation from God is sin remember the Israelites had promised to do whatever Joshua required them and they they said they would keep the whole law in in, in uh, they told him that in, in chapter one now after conquering uh, one city they find that they are in sin before God you see folks we are all Achans from time to time and when we are when we are our sin causes aching in our lives and so often in our lives and those around us but these verses tell us that God has a prescription for an Achan heart and it is first to, a painful defeat happened in, in, the, in the army, or in the camp of Israel. And Israel was a confident people. Israel was still basking in the glow of their victory from Jericho. And they looked at Ai. And they felt like that little town would be no problem for such a great army. Israel was confident they were a confident people, but a closer look reveals that their confidence was misplaced. In verse 3, they felt like that just a few uh, thousands of the soldiers were needed to secure the victory at Ai. You see, folks, these people are guilty of resting on their victory. Amen? Amen? They're guilty of resting on their victory. Israel did not realize it. But they are living through one of the most dangerous times of life. The time just after a great spiritual victory is a dangerous time. Amen. And often, like Israel, we will be overconfident and believe that we can handle any battle that comes our way. Proverbs 16, verse 18 says, Pride 
goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. You see, confidence is a good thing as long as your confidence is in the right place. Right? Israel was a conquered people. And when Israel went up to Ai, they suffered a terrible defeat. And 36 of their men were killed. And, and, and looking more closely at their actions, it is easy to see that they made several mistakes. <clears throat> mistakes that many of us are guilty of making as well. Nowhere in this passage does it even hint that Joshua and the people of Israel sought the will of God for dealing with Ai. You ever read that? No, you don't see it in there. If they had prayed, God would have revealed the problem before people died, before the defeat. Folks, success today does not guarantee your success tomorrow. Amen? The fact that Jericho had been successfully destroyed was not a guarantee that the, the town of Ai would be destroyed successfully. The success of conquering of Jericho was due to the obedience of the Israelites to the commands and to the will of God. That's why God gave them a victory at Jericho, because they obeyed what God told them to do. They were seeking him. <clears throat> so as long as they were faithful to God, he would protect and lead the people. But folks, as soon as there was disobedience, God could no longer work with his people. You see, it's far better to consult God before we make the mistake than it is to expect him to clean up the messes afterwards. You see, the people of Israel didn't take the Ark of the Covenant into the battle either. The Ark of the Covenant symbolizes the presence and the power of God. And they went into battle in their own strength. And that's why they failed. We try to fight the flesh and the enemy in our with our own power often. And we fail every time. See, we don't take the time to strengthen our walk with God. The Israelites have taken some of the, uh, of the devoted things and kept them in their own possessions, the scripture tells us. The devoted things are those things that are devoted for use in the temple of God. Now understand where I'm going here. I'm getting somewhere. The things that were taken. See, God, when God said, when they went in there, everything was a curse because God was going to take everything of value from that city. The Israelites had taken those things for their own pleasure. And, and they were intended to be used only in the temple of God. So as a result, the Israelites are made liable for destruction. Now think about this a little more. The Israelites have misused something intended only for use in the temple. The Bible, folks, tells us, and I, so I asked the question, are we not the temple of the Holy Spirit? Hmm? 1 Corinthians 6, 19, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? And you are not your own. Now, if you didn't realize that today, folks, if you have given your life to God, you've repented of your sins, you're baptized in Jesus' name, you're filled with the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues, you were bought with a price. <coughs> you don't belong to you. You belong to him. He paid for you at Calvary. And see, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives within us. Folks, there's so many people that think, I can live for God any way I want. I beg to differ. You don't belong to you. We 
are set apart for what? For the work of God within us. Now, if, if you like our, our bodies have been set apart for the work of God's service. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your, what? Bodies. A living sacrifice. Now, that's totally contrary to what they did in, in the Old Testament. Everything died as a sacrifice. But here he's saying, as a living sacrifice. How? Holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We are to be transformed. Why? So that our bodies are an acceptable sacrifice unto God. In other words, our bodies are to become vessels for the use by God. Oh, you're quiet on me here. Do you see where this is leading? The Israelites kept for themselves what was required by God for the use of the house of God. And when, when we withhold ourselves, I'm talking to you. When we withhold ourselves from God, folks, we fail into, we, we, we fall into the same sin that Achan committed. God is tapping you in and saying, look, I want you to do this. No, I don't want to do that. I want you to go to here. No, I don't want to go here. When we fail, when we withhold ourselves from God, and what God is asking us to do, we fall into the same sin that Achan committed. Because you don't belong to you. When I, commit, when I committed myself to Jesus, folks, and I invited him to be the Lord of my life, I gave my whole life to God for his use. Why are you so quiet today? When I withhold part of my life from him, after it has been set aside, I find myself in sin before God. Either I am for God or I am for myself, but you can't be for both. Come on. God has a purpose for us, does he not? Did David said, is there not a cause? David was fighting a battle. He was fighting a giant in his life. And God saves you to sit on a pew until he comes, right? No? I didn't think so. God saves you for what? Anybody? A purpose. For what? What's he want us to do? Be about his business. Be soul winner. He spent time on this earth. And now he says we are the body of Christ. We are to be about his business. So when you commit yourself to Jesus and you invited him to be Lord, you may, you may be, many, maybe a lot of people today, especially new Christians, ought to look up what lordship is. I see in, 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 in the Bible times up, that was prominent. You knew the, the king was Lord and whatever he said, you did. You know, we live in the United States of America. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. Well, you found out in the last year or so that they can tell you some things. Or they can try to t make you think they can tell you some things. But see, folks, we, we invited him to be Lord of our lives. We gave our life to him for his use. Don't withhold what you've given to God. Don't, don't uh, just refuse to be used of him. So either I am for God or we're for ourselves. Anything goes before God is a idol. So have you become an idol? When we are walking with the Lord and in the word of God, folks, then we should be, uh, as we should be, then 
he, he will go with us into battle and face our enemies on our behalf. And sometimes I think that some of the battles that come our way and, and just frustrate us, to, we, we, we need to understand that God wants to fight our battles, but we withhold things from him. And when it was withheld from him, going to Ai, he was not with them. And, and, and that goes to show us even some things that don't seem too big. But they're that, it's that constant thing that's there nabbing us all the time. And we, we are ashamed of it. And we're afraid of somebody to find out. And it just seems like it's that one thing that just keeps jabbing at us. It's not a real big, huge problem where everybody notices. But it's something that we try to cover up. I don't want anybody to see this situation. Ai was small compared to Jericho. But see, when they went to Jericho, they were submitting to the things of God. They were obeying him. They were seeking after his input. And when they went to Ai, they didn't even take the ark with them. They were trying to do it on their own. And folks, there's so many things in our life that we try to take care of on our own. Instead of seeking God's will. Instead of saying, God, you got to intervene on this. I don't like, I don't care if it is small, God, you got to take care of it. <laughs> Israel had their confidence in their own power and not in their God in this situation. You see, they were not walking by faith, but they were guilty of trusting what they could do, their own wisdom, their own intellect. And making their own decisions. How many things do we make a decision on without seeking God or seeking counsel? Hmm? And we wonder sometimes why we get ourselves in predicaments. Well, Pastor, can can I can I even make a, this decision or can are are you are you your own? Or do you belong to somebody else? I didn't say, I didn't, this is God. This ain't me. I'm just telling you what God wants from us. God, he, God wanted them to seek him on behalf of, of going after Jericho. And I thought, well, I can, man, we did such a good job over here. Did you do a good job or did God do a good job? See, we get too confident who knocked the walls down? Was it Jericho? I mean, was it Israel? Or was it God? So they, they got confident in themselves. That's how we are sometimes, folks. We, you know, we, we start overcoming things because we sought God and we gave ourselves to the Lord and we start getting, you know, our life. Maybe, maybe at one time you had problems with drugs and alcohol and all this other kind of stuff. And all of a sudden, man, life seems to be going good. You gotta, you're living, living good. And all of a sudden... I don't need to ask God about AI. Why do I need to ask God about every little thing in my life? Because it was all those little things before that got you to where you were before you came to God. What's the old saying? It's the, the, little, the, the little foxes that spoil the vine. It's the little things that start adding up. So God wants us. God, so here they are. They're going to AI. This little problem should be no big deal. We can handle it. And God's like, you're not even taking me with you? They were not walking by faith, but they were guilty of trusting in what they could do, their own wisdom, their own intellect, their own decisions. Freaks, we all need the Lord if we are to walk in spiritual victory in our lives. Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through myself. Is that what that says? No, through him who strengthens me. John 15, 5, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. A few things. Nothing. Was AI something? 
It sure was. See, Israel was a, con a, a, a confounded people <clears throat> after their defeat at the hands of Ai. The people of Israel are feeling the same fear that their enemies experienced. <clears throat> their enemies were afraid. Remember, they sent spies into Jericho, and Rahab helped them out, and she told them, we, we fear you. What you, did to, what you did to Egypt? Egypt was the most powerful nation on the face of the earth at the time. So now, all of a sudden, because Israel didn't trust God, Israel didn't take God with them, Israel didn't relied on their own confidence, and so on and so forth, folks, so now they are feeling the same fear that their enemies experienced. That's not what God intended. That's not what God wanted. He doesn't want us to fear. In fact, he tells us, you can't live for me. In fear, you have to have faith. This is one of the problems with sin. Nothing is right in your life while there is sin in the midst. See, Israel didn't know at this point what was wrong. And thankfully, God wants his people to have the victory and not defeat. So he takes the necessary steps to reveal to the nation of Israel just exactly what the problem was. And folks... Finding out sin in our life is painful. <clears throat> Joshua and the elders, they were the leaders. They reacted in prayer. And, and after the tragedy happens, Joshua and the elders find themselves before the Lord in prayer. In Joshua 7, verse 6, And Joshua rent his clothes and fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord until the even tide. And he and all the elders of Israel put dust upon their heads. There is also a hint of anger accusations against the Lord. But they are going to learn that prayer is the correct resource in time of trouble. But folks, th but the prayer will avail nothing until the sin has been defeated. Psalm 66, verse 18, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Or you say, if I regard sin in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Joshua wonders why Israel was powerless in the battle. And the answer wasn't to blame God or to dispute his will. The answer was, it's in me. It's in the camp. And after we have made decisions that brought with them terrible consequences, it is never the right time to accuse God of anything. When there is a defeat in our lives, folks, we need to look within and see where the problem is. God rehearses the problem. And while Joshua and Israel try to figure out what is happening, God already knows, and he tells Joshua all about it. He tells him that there is sin in the camp of Israel, it, that it is the sin that is hindering the power, God's power in them, and it is what is bringing about defeat in their lives. He also tells Joshua how to discover the guilty party. And in these words to Joshua, God gives us some insight into sin of which we need to take note of, folks. God knows about our sin. Come on. Proverbs 15, verse 3. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. Hebrews 4, 13. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him whom we have to do. God also hates sin. Amen? Proverbs 6, verse 16 through 19. These six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, a hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among the brethren. God hates those things. They're an abomination to him. Also, God has a plan for the sin, for our sin. 
In 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Psalms 32 and 5, I acknowledge... <clears throat> I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. And God, understand this, will always punish our sins. Galatians 6, 9, and let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Also, folks, sin affects people around us okay your sin my sins have the ability to drastically lower the spiritual temperature of the church and we are all one body and what affects you affects me hmm you know the kind of cuts I really hate at the end of my fingertips it might be small but it bugs the fire out of me because everything you touch is a constant reminder hmm you ever smash your get a black and blue fingernail that kind of everything you touch it seems like it seems like you never used that finger before that's what it seems like but all of a sudden now that it's hurt you use it for everything right and it just annoys you folks we are one body and when somebody is not doing right, there's that annoying. Oh, why? Come on. We are the body of Christ. So sin affects everybody. And sin also hinders God's work. Matthew 13, 58. And he did not many mighty works. Why? Why? Because of their unbelief. It's talking about Jericho. I mean, uh, uh, sin must be dealt with. All right? Sin must be dealt with. Either you and I deal with our sin or God will deal with them. Well, one way or the other. They will be dealt with. Amen? 1 Corinthians eleven thirty one. 31. For if we judge ourselves, for we should not be judged. Often, the greatest problem faced by the church come from within and not from without. Right? You see, it is not the water on the outside of the boat that causes the problem. It's the water that gets in the boat that causes the problem. Right? In these verses, the wages of sin are put on clear display for all to see. Romans chapter 6, verse 23, for the wages of sin is death. Anybody work a job here? Do you get wages? Do you like your wages to be a lot? See, that's, we, we can think of wages in that way, and we like that. We want them to be much. But here the scripture says the wages of your sin, in other words, the effects of your sin, what you're going to get as a result of your sin. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So if you sin, you get paid back. The sinner discovers things. And God knew who was guilty. And why didn't he just tell Joshua who, who they were looking for? Anybody? <coughs> That's one thing, yeah. Would have been too easy. Right? God was giving Achan time to repent. Time to confess his sin. And if he had confessed and repented, it may have turned out differently. And that is why it is in situations in church, in God's church, but sooner or later it will be dealt with. 
And I've had people, Pastor, why don't you just go nail them? Because there has to be a time for them to receive it. And sometimes you can go nail somebody and they're not ready to receive it. And you make things even worse. Come on. But God was giving, see here, God told him, look, I want you to go through, and we're going to go pick a tribe, and then we're going to pick a family out of the tribe, and then out of that family, we're going to, and as all this time going on, he could have went up and confessed. See, and that is why in this situation in God's church, we have to deal with it in the right time. The lesson for us needs to be learned well. God already knows your sin. And his finger is getting closer and closer to your life. You are the one. You know, so God wants us to be, okay, God, I understand. I'm going to throw myself at your mercy. Hmm? It will not and cannot be hid forever. Numbers 32, verse 23, but if ye will not do so, behold, ye have sinned against the Lord, and be sure your sin will find you out. In Luke 12, 1 through 3, in the meantime, when there were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch that they trod one upon the other, he began to say unto his disciples, first of all, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. For there is nothing covered that shall be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. Therefore, whatsoever ye have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light, and that which ye have spoken in the ear in closets shall be proclaimed upon the housetop. The sin, folks, will be made, made known. Now that sin is out in the open, it has to be dealt with. And so often in church, we don't want to do that. And notice the two aspects of the section. When Joshua speaks to Achan, Joshua's not screaming and yelling at him. Joshua speaks to him with love in his heart. He knows that Achan is condemned, but Joshua still cares for this man who brought so much trouble to Israel. And that is why, folks, we should try to deal with those in the church who have sinned. Even though many, uh, even though men in this army, or, or, or even though man is the enemy of God, I'm sorry, God still wants man to repent and to come to him for salvation. Achan's family confessed his sin. He finally confessed his sin, I'm sorry. But, does, but folks, don't believe for a second that Achan repented. He confessed it, but he didn't repent. He's like some of the others in the Bible. They, they confessed his sin after he got caught in them, but was never real repented. God wants man to be open. God wants man to be honest about the sin in his life and for, for him to confess those things to the Lord. In Proverbs 28, verse 13, he who conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will find compassion. God's ways, God's way is for his people to throw the covers off their sins and tell him the truth that he already knows. He already knows it. He can bless a person who handles sin the biblical way. And, and, and folks, but the person who tries to hide his sins will never prosper, but will face God's judgment. You will confess your sins one way or another. You will confess them where the confession will make a difference, or you will do that when you face the Lord at judgment. Now, the, pro, the, the progression of, Abraham, or of Achan's sin was this. He said, I saw, I coveted. And I took. And it is, and in, it is, in, and will be the way in nearly any instant of sin that you name. I saw, I coveted, and I took it. 
But the other problem that Achan, Achan had, he found, was Achan calls the things that he took, he called them spoils. This word refers to the body that a conquering army can claim after the victory. But these things were not spoils. God told them they were not. God said uh, that these things were his, and they were to be placed within the treasury of the Lord's house. And Achan, folks, was guilty of stealing from the Lord. Are you guilty of that sin? Malachi 3, verse 8 says, Will a man rob God? For ye are robbing me. But ye say, How have ye robbed you? In tithes and in offerings. Now notice this. Achan had things buried in his tent that he could not use. To use them would, to be, would, would reveal his character to the entire nation of Israel. So in other words, Achan sinned and died for nothing. The things he stole were no good to him at all. See, these verses give us the sad conclusion of the tragic tale that Achan and all that he had were taken out of and stoned to death by the people of Israel. Now, it did not have to end this way. These verses demonstrate the horrible end that all sinners who refuse to repent will come to. The name of the valley is called Achor, which means trouble. Folks, if you're going to sin, especially and, and, and never repent, you need to know you're headed for trouble. Come on. You're headed for Acor. Sin that you have not repented of, sin in your life, you need to know that sin is a hindrance to you and the church. And sometimes people wonder why we are so particular that every person, every member of the church be what they ought to be in the sight of God. And I want you to know that one member of this church, one Sunday school teacher can destroy the whole Sunday school in the sight of God. One leader who is wrong with God can grieve the spirit of God so that he cannot bless our church. One member in this place can quench the power of God, folks. Folks, we need to understand this. God does not look at us so much as an isolated units, but as a whole, as a body of Christ. The weakest link in the body of Jesus of Christ is the Christian like Achan who had sinned against God. Folks, you need to know that your sin, your indifference, your backslidden state affects the whole church and the blessings of God upon it. You see, the people of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. For Achan took of the accursed thing. You've all heard sermons all your life about Achan taking the accursed thing. The sin of Achan. The sin of Achan. The sin of one man brought absolute total defeat on the whole nation of Israel. What was the sin of Achan? What trespass did Israel commit in the person of Achan? God had said when they went into the city of Jericho, everything was accursed. That means it was devoted to him. Everything. You don't touch any of it. You don't use any of it for yourself. Every bit of it belongs to me. Achan went in. He saw the Babylonian garment, a wedge of gold, a spoils of Jericho. And he said he saw it. He covered it, and he took it, and he hid it. He committed the trespass in the sight of the Lord. Now, if you don't get anything else from what I say, I want you to understand what the sin of Achan was. It is the same sin. That many of us today, many, you or I, so often, sometimes unconsciously, 
sometimes without even conviction. Understand that the sin of Achan will bring defeat to any Christian life. And it will bring defeat in the church also. Do you know what the sin of Achan was? The sin of Achan is taking that which belongs to God, which has been dedicated to God, and using it for ourselves. The sin of Achan is talking, or the sin of Achan is taking that which has been concentrated to God and using it for ourselves. Folks, God said they hid, uh, hid it among their own stuff. What a commentary that is in the lives of, of great many of Christians. They have taken what belongs to God, and they have put it among their own stuff. As though it was theirs. As though they could do with it as they pleased. Achan took that which belonged to which had been consecrated and dedicated to God, and he used it for himself. You say, well, I don't see what it has to do with us. Listen to what God has to say in 1 Corinthians 3. Whoever defiles the temple of God, him will God destroy because God's temple is holy. The word holy means consecrated. It means devoted. It means dedicated. And you are that temple. Right? We are the temple of God. You are that temple. The sin of Achan is taking my, this body, which belongs to God, which has been dedicated to God, and using it for myself as I see fit, however I, however I please. And that's a breach of trust. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19-20. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. We don't belong to ourselves. He paid a price for us. You have no right to use the body of yours for any other reason except to glorify God. Come on. Come on. The sin of Achan was, which, which is still with us, is taking this body or anything else that belongs to God, that has been dedicated, that has been consecrated to God, and using it for myself in a way that will not bring glory to me. Because it's God's. You have no right to take that which has been consecrated and dedicated to God by the blood of Jesus Christ and use it for yourself. Storing it among your own stuff just like it is your own property. My body is not my property I have no right, I have no business, no say, in, say so in what God does with me, with my body. Now, many don't realize this, but if you are saved, that is the predicament you are in. <laughs> How do you like that? To take it up with God. Come on. Now, I'm sorry, someone, I'm sorry that somebody did not explain that to you when you got saved. But I'm explaining it to you now. Okay? It's too late. You're already in a fix. And I want you to know that if God has saved you, your body is his. If you got a problem with it, talk to him. Come on. God already knows about your sin. And it's touching your heart and he's giving you time just as he did Achan. What are you going to do about it? 
In Proverbs 7, 24 through 25, Hearken unto me now, therefore, O ye children, and attend to thy words of my mouth. Let not thine heart decline to her ways. Go not astray in her paths. Deuteronomy 24, one, uh, uh, 16, the father shall not be put to death for the children, neither the shall the children be put to death for the fathers. Every man shall be put to death for his own sin. Achan's wife and children knew about that sin. You see, folks, there, these verses gives us a sad conclusion to the tragic story. Achan and all that he had were taken out and were stoned to death by the people of Israel. And it didn't have to end this way. But these verses demonstrate the horrible end that all sinners who refuse to repent, they will come to that. The name of the valley is called Achor. The word means trouble. And if you are going to sin, you need to know that you are headed for trouble. In Proverbs 13, 15, good understanding giveth favor, but the way of the transgressor is hard. If you are a child of God, you have unconfessed, unrepented sin in your heart today, in your life. You need to know your life can be hindered, a hindrance to this church, a stand. You need to know that God will chasten you and bring you back in line with his will. But what, what right does God have? Revelations 3, 19, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, be zealous, therefore, and repent. My advice to you is that you need to get right with God. God knows what it is that will take, uh, what takes to touch your heart. He knows. And he, he is not afraid to touch that heartstring, if he knows it will bring you to repentance. If you are here today and you're lost, there is only one thing you need. You need to come to Jesus for salvation. You see, if you fool around and you die without him, you will wind up in hell, lost forever in the flames of torment. I ask you, is that what you want? Is that where you want to end up? If you do not, you need to come to Jesus. See, years later, the prophet Hosea mentioned this same valley. He said in Hosea 2, chapter, chapter 2, verse 15, And I will give her vineyards from thence, and the valley of Achor for a door of hope. And she shall sing there as in the days of her youth as in the days when she came up out of the land of Egypt. You see, folks, the promise is that this place of trouble would become a door of hope. The same is true concerning your sins today. If you will ask the Lord to help you and ask Him to forgive you, those sins that are going to cause you lots of trouble, they can be taken care of. I'm telling you, this altar can literally become the door of hope for you right now. If you will come and you will seek Jesus and you ask him to cleanse you, forgive you, there is help in Jesus if you will come. This, this altar is open today.